Great, good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us for the first in UTJ series of high holiday related programs with Rabbi Marian Novak presenting on From Breakup to Makeup. Please know that this program is being recorded. Also, everyone is muted, but we welcome thoughts and comments and questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to address questions at the end. My name is Scott Kamelkoff, and I am the coordinator of the Union for Traditional Judaism. Before we begin, a few remarks and notes. Thank you to our sponsors for this program. On the sustainer level, Rabbi Gerald Sussman, supporter level, Dr. Noam Stadlin, and at the friend level, Rabbi Noah Gradovsky in honor of Rabbi Marian Novak and Mrs. Ms. Leslie Kersner in memory of Jan Blumenthal Eng. For those of you who are new to UT UTJ, let me add a few words of introduction to our organization. The Union for Traditional Judaism is a group of rabbis, scholars, and lay people who advocate for a passionate, open-minded approach to Torah, study, and observance of Jewish law, rooted in classical religious sources and informed by modern scholarship. Our philosophy is distinguished by the symbiotic relationship between faith in the God-given Torah and intellectual integrity and our emphasis on the sacred framework of halakha, Jewish law, as our unifying guide. Finally, let me introduce our speaker, Rabbi Maria Novak. Rabbi Maria Novak received her smicha, rabbinic ordination from Yeshivat Maharat in 2019. She served her rabbinic internships at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale and Congregation Nitzvot Shalom in Teaneck, New Jersey. Rabbi Novak has been on the faculty of the Milton School of Adult Jewish Learning for over 25 years and has served as gabayit and bat mitzvah tutor for the Skokie Women's Tefillah Group. She has served as scholar in residence and lecturer at various congregations. She, rece she received her BA cum laude from Barnard College in political science and has a JD from the School of Law of Washington University in St. Louis. Last fall, Rabbi Novak joined the Judaic study staff at Akiba Strecker day Jewish Day School. Additionally, she is an educator with the Jewish Learning Collab and has recently joined the Hadassah Foundation Board. She writes a popular blog for the Times of Israel and is a rabbinic advisor for a mitzvah to eat. She lives in Skokie, Illinois with her family. Please, Rabbi Novak. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you to the UTJ for um, letting me share a little bit of Torah with you this evening. Um, as we all know, if you're taking a look at the calendar, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are coming. And um, one of the interesting things that we do is we proclaim God as king, as keynote of, of the liturgy. We start off with Hamelach, the king. And I've been thinking about this more recently with the passing of my parents' sovereign, uh, the Queen Elizabeth II, um, which for those of us who live in the US, it's um, the idea of royalty is a little strange. And the idea of uh, having a king or a sovereign or a queen is, is a little foreign to us. However, it is built into our liturgy and that kind of relationship that we have with God comes to a head on the Yamim Noraim. But that kind of relationship comes after a terrible rupture. If we go back into our calendar, um, not too long ago, it was Tisha B'Av. And Tisha B'Av um, is really represents the most horrible destruction of, of a relationship that we that we have. And then a few weeks, not too many weeks later, we come together enough that we are, we feel confident enough that we can make God our sovereign. So what I want to look at is the lectionary, this is a new word that I learned, the, the schedule of Haftarot that we have leading up to Tisha B'Av and those that lead up to Rosh Hashanah. And from this, we get an idea of how that relationship can come back together, um, that it's uh, confident enough a relationship to come back together that we can actually be servants of a Kaddish Baruch Hu and have God as, as our King. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm, I really don't like to share sources here, but it'll make more sense to us. So hopefully this will, will work. There we go, awesome, okay. So what I want to look at is right before Tisha B'Av, we have three Haftarot, the Shlosha de Puranuta, the three Haftarot of rebu rebuke or admoni admonition, and they describe in a systematic way of what the relationship was and how it completely falls apart. And then the first 
uh, Haftarah that we have. Um, the selections come from Yirmiyahu and Yishayahu. And the first Haftarah that we have, we have a familiar refrain. The Jewish people have forsaken God, have broken their covenant. And if they don't repent, then God will punish them severely. Um, so in this first Haftarah that we see, ba basically he says, uh, if we take a look at uh, these particular verses, and the Lord said to me, from the north shall disaster break loose upon all the inhabitants of the land, that God is summoning all the kingdoms of the of the north to come and destroy destroy the Jews. And if you look at 16, and I will argue my case against them for all their wickedness. They have forsaken me and sacrificed to other gods and worship the works of their hands. So in this statement, Yirmiyahu is telling the people that punishment is coming because of the relationship they had, this close relationship, which in our tradition uh, likens God to a groom and likens the Jewish people to a bride as a loving uh, mutual relationship, although not necessarily of equal parties, but there's, this, there's a, a kind of a recognition, a, a kind of a, upset kind of tone that we have from the Kaddish Baruch Hu, that they have forsaken me. It's a very personal kind of rebuke to the people. It's not that they haven't they have not followed the laws, but there's a personal element. If you notice that they have um, they have forsaken me, Azavuni. They have they have left me. They have left me to sacrifice other other gods. Our relationship, this loving relationship that we had, has has um, has been totally broken down. Now in the second half Torah. Um, it continues this refrain, but it also um, uh, now personifies this relationship a little bit more and turns the loving bride that was B'nai Israel into a prostitute. So if of all, if you look at it as a romantic kind of relationship, this is, would be considered to be not only somebody who's cheating against their partner, but has become, I would say, a professional cheater. Someone who's who is who is completely uh, forsaking the relationship, and uh, just to uh, underline this particular part of this haftarah, on every hill, on every high hill, and under every verdant tree, you recline as a whore. Now, uh, this if this if you if you have this as two people who are in a loving relationship, and this is how one is speaking to the other, um, you can see it as a complete and utter breakdown. Um, you know, we, we've come to uh, uh, ad hominem kind of of, 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 of of rebuke. And it's not just what you've done, they're characterizing the other person as being utterly un, unfaithful. So it, 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 it continues. And the last, uh, the third part, the third Haftarah, um, I'm going to look at it in in three in three pieces. These are the this is the haftarah that we read right before uh, Tisha B'av, the Shabbat right before Tisha B'av, and we will hear echoes of Echa and lamentations in these in this particular haftarah. And um, oops, um, again, here is not only that they've done wrong, but they are personified as evil. It's different than saying they have done wrong. Now they are wrong. That their very essence is evil. Ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. They have forsaken the Lord, spurned the Holy One of Israel, turned their backs on him. So it's not only what they've done. What they've done is bad enough. But when it's put in this language to personify them, you are evil you are depraved, you have forsaken. It's Forsaken is the last part, but this is what they are. It makes the possibility of any coming together gonna to be very difficult. And also we know that great destruction and, and punishment is going, to, is going to come. In the next part of this Haftarah, just to, um, again, they're talking about the uh, what the punishment will look like. And it's very much personified in the actual um, characterization or character of, of a person. Then man's haughtiness shall be humbled and the pride of man brought low. None but the Lord shall be exalted on that day. 
So th there's an idea that in the way that the Jewish people have decided through their actions of sacrificing to other gods, of doing, of, of not, not even following basic social justice laws within Judaism, within the Jewish tradition, that it's, they have become so used to it that it's, they are haughty, that they are, they are almost uh, ca not so much cavalier, but they're proud of their iniquity. They're proud of what they're doing. And the, and the way that the punishment will come is not just through physical punishment, but through psychological punishment to bring them low, to bring them low because they have become this evil. They do evil and they've become evil. And this last part of, of the Haftarah, this is a reflection which is almost directly which we see in Lamentations. Alas, she has become a harlot, the faithful city that was filled with justice where righteousness dwelt. So it came from a city where people did justice where they were righteous, but now it doesn't say they are murdering. It says, they, but now they are murderers. They become the personification of evil. And this reminds me of the Midrash, in, I think it's in Breshit Rabbah, where there's a discussion when the Kodesh Baruch Hu is deciding whether to create human beings. And the angels say, don't, because they are bad. They will be evil. And Hashem responds back saying, but they will have the ability to do good. So again, this is almost kind of a reverse of creation. And maybe the worry that um, Akash Bar who might have had before creating human beings, and they have become. It's, it's not only what they're doing, they are what they do. Their very, their very essence is now they are murderers. Okay, so in this, and just to know that when we read this Haftarah uh, liturgically, when you're reciting, who's ever, who's ever reciting it, they, those particular verses are sung to the tune of Echa, to the trope of Echa. And having done this Haftarah, it's very difficult to switch back and forth from regular Haftorah trope to Echa. But it really, um, it really highlights exactly the, the de degree of degradation and the breakup of that, of that relationship. Um, again, and then here's the last part. I will turn my hand against you. It's a very personal kind of rebuke coming from God. It's almost, you, you kind of hear the heartache from a Kaddish Baruch Hu that we had a good relationship. We, we had, uh, it was loving. It was, it was mutual. It was dynamic. And now, because you have been, you've become unfaithful, not that you only were unfaithful, you've become unfaithful, I will turn my hand against you. I'm going to turn my hand against you. And then again, then we have Tisha B'Av comes, and now we have the complete destruction, a uh, description of the destruction of that relationship, and it tells you why. And here's from Echa, because the Lord has afflicted her for her many transgressions. The city of Yerushalayim, the Jewish people, again, it's told as a way of a relationship where it was a loving romantic, elements of romantic relationship, but a loving relationship. And it's the woman, the Jewish people are very often characterized as the, as the female partner in this relationship. And now the Lord has afflicted her for her many transgressions and how, how terrible it is. Um, uh, again, in this next part in chapter two, the Lord has laid waste without pity all the habitations of Jacob. So it's not only um, the 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 suffering and the loss of life of the Jewish of the Jewish people, but the entire city of Yerushalayim, the entire nation, has become basically um, a, a ruin, completely a ruin. It's like a flaming fire, consuming on all sides. And at the end of Echa, we have this this uh, uh, re 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 realization that's described by the Jewish people of, for truly you have rejected us, bitterly raged against us. Um, and then, but then also saying, take us back, O Lord, to yourself and let us come back, renew our days of old. So the Lamentations, the Echa part describes a complete breakdown of the relationship. And whatever God might've been king of, maybe king of the world or king of the Jewish people, at this point in time in the relationship, God is, there are no people. 
God is king of, of death and ashes. There's, there's no king here. You can't be a king of death and ashes. And there's a realization on the part of the Jewish people within Echa that they have done wrong. They want to come back, but the rejection is so hard. Um, the, the, the Megillah actually ends with, for truly you have rejected us, bitterly raged against us. And then in our tradition, we repeat the verse that says, please take us back. But the Megillah actually ends by saying, you know, this relation, we're, we're this, this is over. This is over. We know we've done wrong. Maybe you'll come back to us, but I don't think we can come back after this incredible destruction and rejection and punishment. So where it stands at Tishabov is complete breakdown of the relationship and also complete breakdown of Hashem's role, at least vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people. He's not the king of us. There's no us here. He's the king of, 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 of destruction, of ruin, of ashes. And you can't be a king. You can't be a king that way. So it's um, the, the bond is completely, uh, totally severed in every way. But after Tishbav, we move into uh, seven weeks of consolation. Uh, we have Haftarot that um, um, it takes seven of them, and we'll see why it takes seven of them, to reestablish the, re the relationship. And what's the interesting thing that we're going to see is that the Haftarot reflect God trying to repair the relationship. You would think that perhaps the Jewish people might be the ones begging for God's forgiveness to get the relationship back. But in the Haftarot that we read from, from the Nevi'im, you will see that it's really God who's doing the dance. And the Jewish people don't accept that comfort. They don't accept it right away. Um, the scholar, um, Rabbi David Abu, Abu Darham, uh, who lived in Seville, he was a Rishon during the 14th, cent, 14th century. Uh, his major sefer was on liturgy and the Sidur, actually. And he noticed that these particular seven haftarot follow a certain continuum. It's a dynamic, like a dating dance, the, the best way that I can explain it now, between the Jewish people and uh, and God. But God is the one who's trying to woo the people back. And it's not immediate. It's not immediate. It takes a while. So I want to look at those, those haftarot. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. I'm sorry. It's never pleasant to have things scroll down your way. But it takes seven haftarot of consolation. Seven, seven of them. And let's take a look at, uh, and they uh, all come from uh, Yishayahu. Yishayahu, the first one, this is very familiar to us. This is, we call it even Shabbat Nachamu, the Shabbat that comes after Tisha Oh, Nachamu, Nachamu, Amin, Yomar, Elokechem. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God. God instructs the prophets to go and comfort the people. The first act of reconciliation is coming from God. In the second half Torah, however, the Jewish people answer and say, well, you know, the last time we were together was terrible, it was really terrible. We had a complete breakdown of our relationship and we were almost completely destroyed. And so in the second half Torah, Sion says, as the personification of the Jewish people, the Lord has forsaken me. My, my, my Lord has forgotten me, has forgotten me. So God starts with the comfort and the Jewish people are not ready to accept. The wound is very fresh. The wound is still very, very painful and they're not ready to go back. There's an element and we hear those echoes in Echa a lot at the end of when God forsakes you, it's hard to even trust in that. So there's a lot of work that has to be done as we're going to see before you can crown God as king. If we look at the third Haftarah, um, Hashem tries again. Okay, first, first round didn't work. They said, well, we're not really sure that we wanna 
re renew a relationship with you. And it takes a lot of trust building. And this is what we would talk about in modern terms. And here Hashem says in the third Havtarah, unhappy storm tossed one uncomforted. Okay, I, I see you, you're like a, uh, a boat that's, and you're not comforted. I will lay carbuncles as your building stones and make your foundations of sapphires. Um, this has um, some elements of returning uh, elements of language that in that refers back to um, Revelation at Sinai. Um, the idea that uh, at some point in time, um, God lays out a, a path of, of sapphires. It's the time of the most rapturous time of the Jewish people where they come truly to be united with God in this uh, a, a covenant. Uh, uh, it's, the, it's, the epip it's the epitome of covenant. They come together. And so I think in this language from Yeshayahu, God is trying to refer back to that time. Remember when we first were together and how amazing it was and the trust that we had in one another and that, that strong relationship that, 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 that we have. But in the fourth half, Haptara, Jewish people are not ready. They're not ready yet. They say, okay, I am he who comforts you. What ails you that you fear man who must die, mortals who fear like grass? Here is Hashem is saying like, hey, you know, I I'm God and I have the power to comfort you. Why are you not accepting my comfort? And the implication is just really, really, really not ready to, to, to reconcile. This dynamic goes back and forth to the fifth Hatara and the sixth Hatara, and it doesn't happen until the seventh Hatara that we finally have the Jewish people willing to come back to this relationship and understand what that dynamic is going to look like. And here it says, I will greatly rejoice in, in the Lord. So okay. I will, my whole being exalts in my Lord. For he has clothed me with gar garments of triumph, wrapped me in a road of victory. Actually, it's not triumph here. I think it's tzedakah. I think of, of justice. He has made things right for me now. Um, I, I have trust in God. I know that we can, things can be worked out. We can, be, we can re, uh, reunite. Um, and to continue, and here's our here's that the element the, that we've seen this whole time, this imagery, like a bridegroom adorned with the turban, like a bride bedecked with her finery. So again, at the end, it takes a long time because the rupture was so, so, so serious, um, was so painful for the Jewish people and the ability for the Jewish people to trust it's still a dynamic relationship, but it is God who's coming and saying, let's try this again. Let's try this again. I comfort you. I, I realize what your suffering is, but in the same way that I had the power to punish, I also have the way to comfort and to make this relationship good again. And so in the last part, finally, we have the Jewish people going back to their original state where we have, which happens at Revelation, at Sinai, at Mamad Har Sinai, where they are the bride, the bride and the bridegroom. Now, granted, it, the, it is a dynamic relationship, but not with equal partners. But there seems to be, at this point in time, an acceptance upon, of, of, of the Jewish people to see God as a loving partner, although a partner with a great deal more power than the Jewish people have. Uh, and that's a power that they want to, to avail themselves of. They want that comfort. They want that protection. They want to recognize that, um, that God can, can be in, in that position, that God can be, be, there, be, there, be their king. And it's necessary, I will say, in both ways, that uh, we, we'll see a source in a second, that the last time we saw God as king, when we saw it in... in, in um, on Tisha B'Av, it was uh, God, a king of ashes and, dis and destruction. Um, the, my, my source here, it comes from the Kad HaKemach. And uh, this is uh, an important thing. Uh, this is a, a um, talking about Rosh Hashanah. I'm just going to read it because the, it's such a strong point. 
uh, that it takes a while for this relationship to happen again. Also in this mitzvah is an allusion to his blessed kingship for on this day Rosh Hashanah, the world was created and he was king since there is no king without a people. He was talking about why you blow a shofar because it's, it's a way to herald in uh, a new king. I don't know if they're going to blow trumpets when King Charles III has his um, official coronation. Um, a, a lot of the ritual for the coronation of kings and queens uh, comes from our, our, our ritual and our history of, 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 um, of, 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 uh, from coronation of, of our kings. Uh, the, uh, I don't know if any of you, uh, especially now, uh, have watched the series The Crown on Netflix. One of the most fascinating things is they show exactly what happened in, in the private area when Queen Elizabeth II of blessed memory was ordained as queen. She is anointed with oil. That's her, her smicha. Um, it is, it comes, she's from the divine right of kings, which comes, which comes from us, but it doesn't work if you don't have a people. So when we crown um, Hashem on, uh, on, on Rosh Hashanah, it starts with Tantfilat Shacharit, Yom Rishon of Rosh Hashanah. It starts, this is where if you have a, a specific Chazan, this is their, their, the, 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 their, their big number. This is when they're going to take the stage, so to speak. And it starts with the, with the actual term, Hamelach, Yoshev al Kisei Ram Venisa, the king who sits on the throne that is exalted and uplifted. And we can only get to that point by having a very, very long process of renewing that, uh, that, that relationship. And I think what's interesting for us to take, um, to keep in mind, as we're now in the month of Elul, is that in the same way that the Kaddish Baruch Hu, through this particular time of the year, works very hard to repair the relationship that he has with the Jewish people uh, so that we can come together and crown God as king. On the smaller level, it is a uh, example for us in our own behavior, but this is the time of the year to do the hard work of trying to repair the relationships that we have in, in our life. Um, and it's hard work. Uh, remember, it only took three half to wrote, three weeks to plunge the the relationship into utter despair and complete rupture. And it takes a long time. And it takes uh, maybe not all partners need to be willing, but someone needs to take that initiative and understand that it will not be immediate. And even for the Kodesh Baruch Hu, didn't get the Jewish people to say, OK, we're going to come back together in one week. It took a long time. It took a, a very concerted process of, 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 of wooing us back uh, and not and being consistent about it and keep and keeping at it until this this would this this particular relationship could be renewed. So when we think about crowning God as king, you can't have a king without a people. Um, and you can't have a, a, a life if your relationships, uh, are, are, are not in good shape. So um, when we come to tshuva, especially, we think about our relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, but I, I always want to think that we have to think about our relationships with everybody else first, even before we approach a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and do that hard work. I would say, well, if Hashem could do it, you could do it too. So it's encouragement, so to speak, but it's an important um, idea to keep, to keep in mind that we had moved, moved from a, a relationship that if you looked on the face of it, you would say there is no way that this, these two parties would ever come back together. And it's unusual that the one who was meeting out the punishment would be the one to try to bring it back. We always think about it more as the Jewish people trying to get Hashem back because of our sins, because of what we have done. There's a recognition that our destruction, at least traditionally, comes from our actions. But what's interesting to see is that it's God 
the God is doing is 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 doing the hard work, is doing the wooing, so to speak, to bring the Jewish Jewish people back. And that is an incredible place, not just to bring them back in the relationship, to bring back a relationship of trust and to understand where everyone is within that relationship. So only with trust, it's not to make God the king as equal, but enough trust to understand that the best way that this relationship is going to be where you have God who sits on a throne that's exalted and uplifted. Al kisei ram venisa. And that we understand what our role is, and that if we can follow those pieces, then we can continue with God's protection and love and uh, to make our, our lives better for the, for, the, for the coming year. So uh, we start from just a place of utter despair of our, of our saddest, saddest day, and we move through that period of time with our own work, but also from Hashem's work, for us, God's work with us to come to this point where we can have this recognition and coronation. And it's a coronation not out of fear, not out of, um, of uh, any sort of pressure, but one of love and of a dynamic relationship. And that should be a template for us as we come into this season and even before we come to speak to Kodesh Baruch Hu, to kind of do that work that we need to do, even in those relationships that we might think are the most uh, destroyed or, 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 or beyond repair. We have uh, a, an idea from the Kodesh Baruch Hu that it's never beyond repair, that we can always repair it and to be willing to do that work. If anybody has any questions or comments. There is a comment in the chat from Mitch Morrison. Uh, the Shiva Dinachemta in many ways is echoed in Rabbi Heschel's classic, uh, God in Search of Man, that God needs us, uh, so to speak, in order for this grand experiment to, of creation to be realized, for man to recognize and subordinate him herself to God. The question, based on this premise, are we at risk of being too arrogant that it makes it harder for us uh, to want God in our lives? And then there's a question too. That's, that's good enough um, to pause on. Yeah, I, I would think otherwise. I think if I knew that I had, that God was in search of me, that would encourage me in the relationship as opposed to discouraging me. I don't think it would it would be, wow, I have this opportunity for this relationship. And it's not, and it's a dynamic one uh, that uh, takes me beyond myself. And I think that's an incredibly good selling point. And I think any risk of worrying that we might become too haughty about it, um, I think even that would be, uh, it's okay. It's a, it's a risk to take because once in that relationship, I, I think those ideas would 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 fall 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 away. So uh, I, I very much ascribe to that idea of of Professor Heschel that uh, this is reflected very often. That um, there's God cannot be uh, 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 a king without people, and um, that should not make us haughty. That should um, um, encourage us uh, that there's a God that cares about us that, um, that uh, we, are, we are not playthings for our Kodesh Baruch Hu. We are We are dynamic and important partners, which I think as far as a religious tradition goes, that is something that is uh, very encouraging uh, and very uplifting. And uh, Mitch, uh, I guess, uh, feels that uh, your answer uh, addressed uh, question number two, but for the record, uh, was in a world of extraordinary scientific and intellectual discovery, how would you recommend uh, we make faith resonate with today's youth? Uh, but if you had something else you wanted to add. Uh, um, so I, I, teach, I teach seventh and eighth graders and, um, and have taught young people for, for a long time. Uh, I think we are, uh, even with what they're learning, I think we make a big mistake to think that everything else will 
steer them away from a connection with God and spirituality. Uh, I think we sell them short. Um, there is a craving for something that's beyond beyond just you. And we have a wonderful tradition to offer them. And I think very often we should know that our Torah can stand up to whatever other knowledge is out there. Um, that the message that we have is something that they will not necessarily find anywhere else and be open to, to, to that ex exploration. So I don't think of it necessarily as competing. I think for a lot of young people, when they're introduced in a, um, uh, 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 in a way that they are able to participate in their own spirituality, you see that they they very much want it and and need it. But it's a lot of it is in the presentation. It's not to think that we are competing with other sources of knowledge, but the Torah can go hand in hand with that and enhance whatever uh, other explorations that they have. It doesn't have to compete. It can enhance and and, and make meaning out of so much. And I think there's just a craving for that in a way that um, we often sell, especially young people, very much short. Um, and I think the trick is uh, how to deliver, how to deliver to, to, engage, to engage them. And I think that's the trick. The trick is that old methods might not work anymore, but that doesn't mean that we need to give up on that project. Um, it's, 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 it's crucial, it's crucial. And I, not only for continuity of Judaism, but our young people need it. I think now more than ever, um, I've said this a lot, um, COVID and lockdowns have especially crushed a generation of, of young people. And uh, they need this, to they need Torah more than ever. Um, they have ir ir irreparable losses um, that will never come back, but we need to support them. And I think this, uh, you know, Torah and uh, spirituality and connection with God is something that people need now, now more than ever. And we should not be afraid to, to find ways to help them connect and not be afraid that they're competing with anything else in their life. They need it. They need it even if they don't, don't realize it. And it's something that we should be offering as much as possible. Okay, uh, I think I beat Rabbi Kalmakoff to the unmute button, which is how I've ended up uh, being uh, presenting the questions and uh, if others have questions you're welcome to put them into the chat uh, or let us know in the chat and we can also potentially unmute. I wanted to mention I'm putting into uh, the chat a link to a video uh, that's available on the UTJ website uh, which is of uh, Professor uh, Reuven Kimmelman uh, speaking about the book about Eicha, the book of Lamentations uh, and he makes an interesting point on the last verse uh, of, of Echa, uh, which uh, Rabbi uh, Novak mentioned uh, about how it kind of ends with this note about because you've, you've uh, punished us so greatly. Uh, and Professor Kimmelman actually argues you could possibly read that a little bit more positively than you would originally think. But the point is uh, that because God has completely punished the uh, Jewish people, that that leaves the door open for reconciliation. Uh, in some ways that probably plays into uh, the verse uh, from Nahamu, uh, where it's, it, it's, you know, come from my people because they've, they've paid their comeuppance, you know, uh, their, 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 their punishment is complete and there's time uh, for reconciliation. So reading it that way, that last verse isn't necessarily as, as negative as we might originally take it. So I thought it was an interesting take and, and a good video altogether for people interested in learning more about, uh, about the book of Eicha. Well, I think it also highlights a point that even though it seems that the relationship is broken, um, God is still um, bound to the Jewish people and the Jewish people is still bound to God. And so it's never a complete rupture, but there always has to be work done to repair the relationship. The foundation is, is always there, but, um, and, uh, and there will be consequences for actions within that relationship, but it, it, it never ends. And it could either be very close or very distant. So uh, the, the, the work to be done is to repair it so that it is close, not that you're starting from nothing. It's, it's, not, it's not a nothingness. Um, there's, a, there's a claim 
uh, from both parties to one, to one another. And so that's why the reconciliation, even though it takes a while, can work. Uh, otherwise, if it was complete, um, complete destruction, there, 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 there's no work that would, nothing could be done. Um, but that's not, that's not the case. And that's an, an important piece to keep in mind as well. Yeah, so I see Noam has put something in about um, the Parsha Kitavo. Uh, it, uh, the Parsha that's coming up this week, um, I think that's what he's saying, um, is we have a God's description of exactly what, what happens that we see in Echa. And in fact, with the language that you see in Kitavo really only shows up again in Echa of complete, of complete destruction if you do not follow follow um, the 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 uh, mitzvot and uh, direct us from from God to the Jewish people. Um, but at the same time, you also have the description of the Jewish people when they come into the land that they will, when they bring their first fruits, they will make this uh, declaration and testimony. And the testimony is first talking about God and history. And then at the end, it has the Jewish people and um, being partners in the history of saying, here, I hear I've brought you these first fruits. So even though this week's Parsha alludes to uh, this complete destruction, which actually does happen, it has elements within it that the Jewish people have the power in their hands to um, repair that relationship as well, and that um, that that's always always a possibility. Uh, it, it's never it's never a complete ending ever. We're going to conclude this evening's program. I just want again uh, to thank you all for being here this evening, uh, and thanks again to Rabbi Novak for leading tonight's shiur. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, whom we named at the beginning of the webinar, and we will also now share in the chat. If you haven't already, please join our email list by filling out the form on utj.org. You'll find it linked under contact us and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Finally, please sign up for the three other programs as part of UTJ's High Holiday Series. The next program is Contemplating Coronation with Rabbi Ira Griscott on Wednesday, September 21st at noon Eastern time. You can learn about each of these programs and sign up at the link that we're going to share in the chat.